Tina Corby, who says this is just typical union behavior. They're not giving in, even when the whole thing could go under. She's joined by Jonas Max Ferris and Sabrina Schaefer. Uh, Tina, what do you mean by that? Well, actually, what I just wanted to point out is that the letter union carriers have a point on one specific thing, and that was the same point that Congressman Cummings made, which is just that Congress is technically supposed to have oversight of the post of the post postal service. So the fact that there's no plan in place right now for the Postal Service does reflect a failure on Congress's part to pass any kind of comprehensive reform, and specifically a failure of, on the Senate's part because the Senate hasn't passed a budget in more than 1,300 days. But all of that said, I mean, you, the conversation you just had with the Postmaster just says it all. The, there are going to be painful cuts, and the union at some point has to recognize that the demand has changed and that we can't continue to have the Postal Service as we've always had it. You know, Sabrina, uh, we've Seen this sort of thing play out in the auto industry, the airline industry, and more recently, Hostess. Uh, <laughs> you just yeah. cannot fight the natural progression of economics. And in this case, there's a lot of things going against uh, the post office, including technology. Are unions going to have to make these sort of sacrifices? Are they going to have to come to the reality that either we give in or the whole thing falls apart? They absolutely are going to have to come to the table, as you suggested. I mean, the reality is that Americans are continually um, looking down on unions. They want to see them have less influence, and the reason is because they they seem to most Americans to be um, thinking about the interests of unionized workers at the expense of other workers, or in this case, of the taxpayer who no longer sees the post office to be as vital a service or, or institution as it once was. You're right. There are many other um, private sort of um, competition now for the post office from FedEx to, to UPS and that's causing some problems and as much as they have tried to adapt it hasn't been um, adequate. You know Jonas it would be fantastic maybe if there was a way in my mind for you for the post office to sort of privatize and, and operate the business to, to, to the postmaster general's point there are some aspects of it that could be profitable and that could actually thrive in this sort of environment but it doesn't look like it would happen. The unions have too much power and sway, and they're just not going to get go down without a fight, if you will. You know, the internet and Congress are what's destroying Saturday delivery. More, the unions are not a positive. I don't want to say they are, and it would be great if they could cut their labor costs in half and make the whole thing profitable. But their competition, UPS and FedEx, have labor problems and costs as well. The difference is. UPS can raise rates if fuel prices go up, and poor Donahue, who's doing a very good job running the post office, has congressional oversight. He can't raise the rates for first class rate of stamps if he has to pay twice as much for diesel as he did 10 years ago. So he has a lot of issues that a free market person doesn't have to deal with. Now, more broadly speaking, is the post office model basically socialized anyway? I mean, you can mail a letter to Alaska for less than 50 cents, and that's what it costs to mail it across town. That's not how UPS charges you. They charge more if you got to mail a package to California. So the business model is suspect. It is subsidizing rural delivery. We have to, as a nation, decide is that something we want to pay for and lose a few billion dollars a year or wipe it out? You know, phones are not profitable to have to this day in rural areas. We, through taxation and rules, right. make that happen so people who live in the middle of nowhere can have a phone service. So, Tina, that takes us back to Washington, D.C., and already we see a real inability to cut spending of any kind, although we all know that we've got a serious fiscal calamity just <coughs> up the road. So, so, what happens here? What do you think happens with this post office situation? This whole thing didn't happen overnight, and yet it feels like it's uh, beginning to crumble very quickly. Well, Charles, I'm with you. We really do have to look at some kind of privatization option. And Congressman Darrell Issa, who's the head of the Oversight Committee, has made proposals to create a separate commission to oversee the post office. There are bills on the table. And as far as the Saturday delivery goes, President Obama even had cutting Saturday delivery in his laughable budget for fiscal year 2013. So this proposal has been out there for a while. It's just that now the postmaster is actually putting it into effect should have happened a long time ago but whether we you know what happens goes back to Jonas's point we just have to decide whether it's important to to communicate to rural areas even if it's at a loss Sabrina we've got just a couple of seconds left uh, ultimately three four day delivery to make this work yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree, and I think Tina hit on some really important points. Not only has there been a loss of $15 billion in the, in the last year, but as Jonas pointed out, there's been a tremendous drop in the actual need or the actual supply. Um, people are using the post office much less than they have right. in years past. So in the end, there's just not the demand, and I think that people will be perfectly satisfied with a five-day delivery. I think so, too. We'll see. I mean, it is it's sort of heart-rendering, but 
it is progress, I guess. Guys, thanks a lot. <laughs> Well, first, North Korea, no matter how we reform health care, we will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. You can keep your doctor. If you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, keep it. You will be able to keep your health care plan, period. Well, the president wasn't entirely right. Because a new report says 7 million people will be pushed out of their employer based health care plans, nearly twice as many as expected. To Tina Corby, Jonas Max Ferris, and Sabrina Schaefer on whether the plan has got it all wrong. Want to start with you, Tina? Yeah, none of this comes as any surprise. The CBO report is just telling us what we already knew from the very first days after passage of this law. Insurance companies were dropping plans. Employers were requesting waivers. The HHS ended up granting 1,231 waivers to different companies who said that they weren't going to be able to abide by the the new um, restrictions on caps. They want to cap the amount of benefits they pay out to their employees. It's just common sense. If you make it unprofitable for insurance companies to do business, they won't. You know, uh, I think the operative word there, Sabrina, was, was common sense. I, you know, when you think about it, you say to yourself, well, golly, if I'm an employer, uh, I can pay a certain penalty for not, uh, you know, not insuring my workers, or I could pay this gargantuan amount of money to insure them under this plan. Which one do I do? I mean, it's, it seems, again, right. like we should have known this was going to happen. And by the way, I think when they continue to sharpen the pencils, this number goes even higher. Oh, I absolutely agree. I remember when Grace Marie Turner of the Galen Institute estimated that 78 million Americans would no longer have their health care plan. And here's why. I mean, what the, what the president is, it was not saying in, in all of those times that he said that you could keep your health care was that businesses were not going, apparently were going to be ignoring their bottom line. But the reality is businesses are between a rock and a hard place here. They are being mandated to provide a government-approved um, package of, of health care benefits or pay this rather modest penalty and send their workers to the, to the state exchanges. Um, and I think that the, the math is pretty easy for a lot of businesses, and so a lot of Americans are going to lose the plans that they are accustomed right. to right now. You know, Jonas, uh, the counter-argument to that the entire time was that, well, a good employer will go ahead and, and pay for this as something akin to a fringe benefit. But it doesn't look like that's happening. Well, okay. First, first of all, it's not your health plan, okay? It's Disney's or UPS, wherever you work. They pick the health. You don't own it. They do. It's part of your no, compensation pack. So the fact that you have any discretion over it is a fantasy anyway. You want to change it, change your company you work for. Now, a lot of companies, and I've read estimates that 90% will keep providing it. And there's a reason for that. There's this huge hole in the tax code where the company gets to pay for your health insurance, and it's not taxable income to you. So they would prefer to pay you a higher paid plan that way than to pay you cash compensation which you have to pay income taxes on. That alone is going to keep it the way it is for 90% of workers. However, no, a lot will get kicked out and that's what the numbers yeah. are, that's what the new CBO estimate is, because it doesn't make sense for all levels of employees at all levels of income for the company to do it because there's a subsidized plan being cooked up by the government right. if you're in low income. And and that makes more sense for people to be on than to have the company pay for a high paid plan. Sabrina? Yeah, but yeah, we're already seeing the, the impact of this. I mean, look at Darden restaurants, you know, uh, Red Lobster and the Olive Garden. This is a jobs killer. And what they're doing is they're, they're transferring people who had full time jobs to part time jobs so that they can get out of providing these health care benefits. Um, I think that we're, we're being very short sighted to think that this is somehow um, good for workers. I think the, the only real solution is to start looking away from government or um, business sponsors. Health care plans for people to actually own their health care so that when they leave a job or um, when government tries to interfere, they actually own those dollars. But isn't that That's the result? If, they, right if you get kicked off the company plan, you have to own your, you have to buy a plan yourself. Isn't that actually a better solution than the current plan, which is nonsense, Absolutely. where your company has to pay for your insurance anyway? I think that's the bad plan yeah. where it burdens an employer with your health care costs. They don't pay your car insurance or your home insurance. Why right. should they pay your health insurance? Right. So I'm saying this is a good right. effect. You're looking at this like it's a negative side of Obamacare. I don't see it that way. Well, uh, the, well, it's negative in a sense, Tina, that certain promises were made to the American public, and a lot of people out there uh, just aren't prepared to follow the Jonas Max Fair's uh, plan and go out and buy their own health care. They're looking for their employer to buy it. They think that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, not necessarily a birthright, but certainly that was promised to them now by the federal government.
Well, I well, just keep thinking those 48 million who were uninsured before were uninsured for a lot of reasons, and one of the reasons might just have been that it, sometimes it's hard to be motivated to go out and research plans and purchase it, and it would be better if that's what Americans did. And that there we have these exchanges too, where you're supposed to be able to purchase health insurance if you don't have it through your employer. But there are all kinds of problems with that under Obamacare as well. It's very clear that they had no plan for what to do if states declined to build exchanges. My home state of Oklahoma declined. And there's actually no legal funding mechanism for federally run exchanges in the state. So it, there again, those people who are going to be depending on the exchanges to get insurance because their employers are no longer providing it, they might be out in the cold as well. You know, guys, uh, we've got a minute left, and I want to go across the panel and kind of get a sense. Do you think ultimately that the, the not, we won't have necessarily single payer, but the government will end up uh, doing the bulk of the ins insuring of, of employees in this country? Jonas, what do you think? Employees, no. Em Non-employees, yes, because they already are with so Medicare and Medicaid and now expanding insurance to people with lower income. The workforce, until they get rid of the tax deduction, and there are some effects of that down the road with the Cadillac plans, but in general, the tax deduction exists where an employee, an employer has an incentive to pay you this way. It will stay this way. It's a bad system, right. but that's going to stay in place for a while. Tina? Yeah, my gut says that the government is going to be more and more involved, but I just wish that weren't the case because I think that private companies could do a much better job. And even from the charitable component, the government can't outdo charities in terms of just providing genuine care to people who need it for, you know, out of the goodness of their heart. So, uh, yeah. And Sabrina, real quick. Yeah, sadly, government is going to get more and more involved, but people should pay attention to the fact that it doesn't make sense for everybody to receive everything. There's no way that that's sustainable, right. nor does it make economic sense. And bottom line, guys, uh, a lot of people will not get to keep their health care provider. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Yeah. All right, you guys. <laughs>